I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Todd, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my, my great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an exciting time um, for the life of the center, for sure, and it's a very exciting time in the life of this unbelievably timely, impactful, compelling, interesting, controversial, and on and on technology. So I'm looking forward to um, uh, catching everybody up with the CRISPR craze and talking about applications and implications of this very disruptive and interesting tech. Um, so I've had the privilege to actually work on CRISPR for 15 years. Uh, I'll get to that in a few minutes um, and, and substantiate my claims of legitimacy in the prehistory days of CRISPR um, in various capacities. Currently, I'm an academic, as, uh, as Todd mentioned, I'm the T.R. Glenn Hammer Distinguished Professor in Products Research in Food Science. Um, and I've worked in industry before, and I've had the, the, the great challenge and opportunity to really understand what it takes to do translational science and really understand what scientific underpinning of a question of interest um, um, is the basis of on which to build. And then hopefully sometimes we can translate science into useful technology and occasionally even get the pleasure to apply some of those technology to eventually develop products that hopefully will be commercialized, uh, accepted by regulators, accepted by the public and this is called the valley of death for a reason industry. It's very hard to do. It's very expensive to do. It's very difficult to do. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of resources, lots of smart people and, and fancy budgets and the like. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is illustrate for you how far and how fast um, this timeline has been for CRISPR, how exciting maybe and how bumpy uh, it has been over time. At the nexus of academia, I'm an academic and editor-in-chief of the journal. Working with industry, I spent nine years at DuPont and I'm involved in a number of CRISPR startups. Uh, working with governmental agencies, I've had a chance to go to the, to the White House and talk to the OSTP about CRISPR, talk to Congress about CRISPR and USPTO about CRISPR and others. And then obviously in the spirit of genome engineering and society, I'm going to talk about genome engineering, but I'm also going to talk about society, not just the application of duplications thereof, and understanding how to develop narratives to compel the public to understand science, understand technology, and if they so wish, uh, accept it uh, or not. So where are we today? Um, amazingly, we are already in a post-CRISPR world where there are people on NPR, on TV, in the movies, in the streets of our own country that have had some of their genomes edited using CRISPR, right? So there are people deambulating um, uh, in the world who have had already some of their genomes edited. Some of the numbers are unbelievable. So those are numbers from AdGene. Um, this not-for-profit organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts has shipped already 200,000 constructs across the globe. 88 different countries have had labs that have received those constructs. And there are guesstimates that about a million scientists, I'll get back to that in a minute, one million scientists are using CRISPR on a daily basis to enhance, alter, manipulate, and edit the genomes of organisms, as a matter of fact, across the tree of life. If we look a little bit about some of those explosive numbers, and now you don't look at adjunct shipments, but papers that are being published on genome editing just since 2000, since Y2K, right? So you remember that. So the advent of those technologies have revolutionized and democratized genome editing, right? 20,000 papers have been published to date, mostly in the last couple of years, working on different topics. Uh, I'll talk about the topics and applications for sure. And this is truly global. As you can see here on a heat map, the US is number one, has been number one, is predicted to remain number one for the foreseeable future. But at the current pace of adoption and current pace of investment and current pace of commitment, strategically so, China may supersede the US in volume, uh, if not quality, around 2022. So we may be you know, 14, 15 months away from being just tied for number one, the CRISPR space. And if you look at the top 10 countries right here, there's some interesting patterns uh, because as a matter of fact, after the US and China, Europe with Germany, the UK, we can talk about whether the UK is Europe or not, in a different conversation, France, uh, Holland, the Netherlands, and Italy are 
constituting half of the top 10 CRISPR powerhouses in the world. But we will discuss how challenging the regulatory regime is. And it's truly international besides US and China and Europe. Obviously, Canada is in play, Japan is in play, and Australia is in play, putting Oceania on the map. Very competitive, very strategic, very interesting, very compelling. Um, I, I have a paper right now in, uh, in review, uh, mining the CRISPR literature and trying to understand the forces driving the advancement of that technology. And this is a heat map and a co-authorship map of the 50 most cited, influential, and published CRISPR authors in the world. And you can see that there are networks of people like Peng Zhang and Eugene Kunin working on genome editing, People like Jennifer Doudna working on technology, people like us and the, the, the CRISPR community in bacteria, and a few people having different applications and screens and base editing and on and on and on. But the point here is that in this very competitive, very illustrious, very peculiar, high-end, cutting-edge technology, almost every single leading author in the world is working with their colleagues, transcending the boundaries of competitiveness. This is what it takes to take science and technology to the next level. And if you look on the right at the topics and things that they work on, it's very interesting to note that there is significant overlap, as you can split to, but interwovenness of what it takes to advance technology and use it from science to tech and apply it to develop products and hopefully uh, tangible things that will have a real impact. Now, if you map the 98 topics over time that have sprouted across the CRISPR literature in the last 15 years, starting here with CAS nucleases and real CRISPR-Cas systems in the mid-2000, the advent of guide RNA technology from Jennifer, its use for mutation, gene therapies, advances to the clinic, gene transcriptional control, antivirals, and screens have revolutionized the world, primarily of medicine. What's interesting to note, however, despite this diversification thematically, is that 90% of all those papers focus on humans and human cells. And 90% of those studies focus on therapeutic investigations of understanding health and disease, notably cancer and infectious disease. And we know the NIH budget is sizable, but how many millions of people across the globe can really benefit from CRISPR-based therapies versus the billions of people who can benefit from their use in food and app. I'm asking the question, I may not answer it. So there's some dichotomy between where people are focusing their energy and expending large budgets versus maybe where they should spend their energy and expend other people's budgets. So now that we have an idea of where we are, let's try to briefly understand what genome editing is, much like genome editing spells out, uh, it is a tool or a technology that can very precisely target DNA and cut DNA. Think control F in Word if you have opened uh, a genome of interest uh, in a Word document. And what we can now do is at this very precise site of CRISPR generated cleavage, the double stranded DNA break is typically generated, we can edit the text, we can change the DNA content pretty much at will and insert alter, remove, modify, change, add a single base pair, a single letter, this G to an A, or take out a word, take out a sentence, take out a whole chapter of the book of life, or change its content therein. This is why it's called genome editing. We virtually have the power genetically to change the DNA code at will across the tree of life. In the last 10 years, those um, uh, leading authors across the globe, it's about 70,000 authors that have published 17,000 papers from 7,200 different institutions and affiliations in 122 countries, have advanced the technology to a whole toolbox I'm not going to go into. The bottom line is that virtually today, the average geneticist with the average knowledge in an average lab has the ability to manipulate the genome, the transcriptome, and the epigenome almost like this of any organism of interest across the tree of life. And as a matter of fact, in the last few years, people have shown 
that you can readily use CRISPR to rewrite the genomes of simple organisms like viruses, bacteria, yeast, all the way to non-humanoid chimps as model organisms that academics love to study and use and understand and decipher. The same has happened in the food and ag supply chain, crops and livestock, think of not crisp chicken, crisper chicken, right, and the like. And then obviously at the very top of the value chain and the scientific pyramid in medical applications, medical research and translational medicine. To illustrate the power of CRISPR here, let me give you one example. You can, you can take a butterfly like this, beautiful butterfly, and the butterfly wing pattern is very much the butterfly equivalent of the human iris. It has a very unique pattern, very unique color combination. No two butterflies in the world, unless they are clones, have the same wing pattern. The average butterfly geneticist circa 2014 can take some cells out of this butterfly, target a gene called yellow, and knock out yellow and literally grow a smaller butterfly in which the color yellow has been removed. You can do that with the color black. If the average geneticist that studies butterflies has the ability to recolor the wing pattern of butterflies, I would make the argument that there's no technical limitation whatsoever, but our imagination as to what scientists can now do with this powerful technology perhaps for good or perhaps for bad, we shall discuss that. So in the last few years, accordingly, those 200,000 labs, maybe representing about a million scientists across the globe, have used and harnessed this technology across different business segments, the research space for biotechnology, the biotech industry, editing bacteria, yeast and algae commonly used to manufacture food products, bioproducts, household care enzymes, detergents, biofuel, bioenergy. As of late, it's been upgraded to agriculture with plants, livestock, microbes, forestry, and CRISPR edited trees on NC State campus, flowers, ornamentals, aquaculture, and all the way up the value chain to human therapeutics. Gene therapies, beta thalassemia, sickle cell, and Leber congenital amaurosis have all been addressed and tested clinically in the US in FDA condoned clinical trials antivirals, infectious disease, microbiomes, antimicrobials, cell immunotherapies, the current issue of nature has a CAR-T engineering using CRISPR paper going to the clinic. Engineering tissue in animals for xenotransplantations, gene drives, diagnostics for COVID-19, pet care, pet cloning, on and on and on and on and on. All those fields have had CRISPR touch them, impact them, revolutionize them. Just my lab, just the CRISPR lab at NC State is involved in everything that starred here on this very slide. Now, besides the scientific enthusiasm, as somebody who also went to business school and worked in the real world and industry, I think one of the most mesmerizing things about the impact of CRISPR is the fact that there's a whole cluster, a whole bioeconomy, a whole set of entrepreneurship experiments that have been carried out in the last few years based on CRISPR. At the very top, the first generation CRISPR companies, Caribou, Intelia, CRISPR-TX, Editas, all came about or founded in 2014 within one year of the proof of concept that CRISPR can edit human cells. NTLA, CRSP, Edit, and Beam are already listed on the NASDAQ with a valuation as of a half hour ago in excess of $10 billion. It has sprouted a whole second generation group of companies looking at thera therapeutics, Beam, Casivia, Mammoth, Sherlock, eGenesis, Casper, Excision, the latest one, Tessera, Alas, last month. There's a whole slew of companies using CRISPR as antimicrobials, Locus, Eligo, and Sniper at the forefront. Obviously, a whole generation of new CRISPR-based biotechnology companies looking at enhancing the tools and providing the toolbox and sharpening those molecular um, uh, scalpels. And obviously, in food and ag, companies like Inari, Pairwise, Trico, and many others. So besides the scientific enthusiasm and the venture capitalist gargantuan appetite for those kinds of technologies, don't listen to what I have to say, what I think, 
you know, let's assess what the World Economic Forum experts are saying. In one of their recent reports entitled Innovation with a Purpose, the Role of Tech Innovation in Accelerating Food Systems Transformation, they have categorized CRISPR as a game changer for food and air. Not, don't listen to me, listen to them. When they identified the key advances in science and technology that are bound that are unquestionably currently re-altering the landscape of food and ag, next generation biotech and genomics is one of only two. And as a matter of fact, when they exemplify how we're gonna be able to create effective food production systems, now they say gene editing for seed improvements is gonna generate up to $100 billion in annual farmer income. 400 million tons of food productivity gains and address micronutrients and food and nutrition and on and on and on and on and on. And they even speculate, I'm not sure I buy the numbers, but they even speculate, go as far as speculating that 10 to 50% of farms in the next nine years, is Q4 later this week, we have nine years left until we reach 2030. 10 to 15% of farms across the globe will have CRISPR edited crops. And it's going to increase value, it's going to increase yield, it's going to reduce food loss and increase nutrition. Think about it as NC State for a minute, not as an investor, right? The Plant Science Initiative, Genome Engineering in Society, Food Science, CALS, CNR, COE, COS. We are uniquely positioned to be in a leadership position here at NC State with things like the PSI to address and be a thought leader and technical leader in those very powerful disruptive technologies. So why do I know so much about CRISPR and how does it impact how I'm seeing it, perceiving it, what biases do I suffer from, and on and on and on. There's many reviews, uh, including a number that I've written on the history of CRISPR, the ages of CRISPR, the tipping points of CRISPR, the antiquity, the dark Middle Ages, the modern period, the contemporary period, and on and on and on and on. But let me give you a few insights and a rationale for where my opinions come from. So I got to spend nine years in the industry at DuPont. And I had my first CRISPR patent in 2005, my first paper in 07, my first CRISPR product in the food supply chain was launched in 2011. I can guarantee you, you have consumed a CRISPR enhanced dairy product at some point since 2011. Do ask the question in the Q&A. My first CRISPR startup didn't occur until almost a decade after my first patent, until I actually left industry and a directorship position at DuPont to be an untenured professor at NC State. And ever since I've joined NC State, I've had the privilege to work with my colleagues here at NC State, like Todd, Cara, and others in GES, but many other faculty across CNR, COS, and CALS on campus. I've worked with Caribou, I've worked with Intelia, I've worked with Locus, I've worked with the CRISPR-J, I've worked with Inari, I've worked with Invio, I've worked with Trico, I've worked with Genome Fund, CRISPR Biotech, and Encilia, and I've had the distinguished privilege to get over 100 papers published on the topic, to get to participate in a movie articulating the history and impacts on society of CRISPR, to have some of my own technologies, my own ideas tested in the clinic already in the U.S., and to work on my 10th startup, and also to collaborate as an NC State faculty with a number of industry leaders that are at the forefront of harnessing those technologies to make the world a better place. But as an associate member and affiliate of the GES, I also understand that there are huge ramifications and implications in play. What narratives, what dialogues, what opinions, whose voices matter when we decide the future of CRISPR, the boundaries of CRISPR, the regulations of CRISPR, the acceptability of CRISPR, the implementation and deployment of CRISPR technologies, right? Are we like the farmer who hears no evil 
maybe scientists who speak no evil or government or businesses who see no evil? I asked the question, we'll see if some of my fellow co-authors will answer that question. Whose opinion matters the most? Whose opinion matters at all or not at all, right? How do we frame those dialogues as consumers and active participants in the research enterprise? I've had, uh, as Todd mentioned at the outset, the, the distinguished pleasure to be part of the, the production team, the management team, the shooting team, and be my own voice um, in uh, Human Nature, a documentary actually available to all NC State um, affiliates through our library. So if you're curious about CRISPR, the only thing you need to do is go to our distinguished library, remotely, not in person at this point in time, given the pandemic, but remotely, and check out this feature. It's amazing being able to uh, literally look behind the curtain and look behind the camera at how to articulate the applications and implications and impact and challenges of harnessing those technologies uh, to make a better world has been mesmerizing and very eye-opening for me as a scientist and as an entrepreneur. I have some opinions too that come from my, uh, my friends, the CRISPR Journal. I'm the editor-in-chief, the founding editor-in-chief of the CRISPR-J. And I think ethics is so important that it was our first thematic issue. I was in the streets of Paris, but when we could travel, going to the Rodin Museum and couldn't uh, help myself but ponder what should we think about CRISPR. Right? So we invited a number of uh, VIPs in this space, and in many ways, some uses of CRISPR in humans are ethically defensible. You know, governance is a challenge. What are the upsides or downsides of a global moratorium, especially as it pertains to germline editing? What are the, the economics of getting access to those fancy, advanced, cutting-edge gene therapies? Who speaks for the children who are not born yet and should anybody do that? Or even could anybody dare to do that? What are the impacts on human rights across the globe in a diversified and unequal world? Challenging world within our borders, let alone across the globe. And then how will the scientific community, how will the business community, how will the biohacker community, how will all those people and users manage this through law and legal regimes? How should we enforce? How should we define boundaries? And, and how should we manage this uh, domestically, uh, internationally, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to ag, when it comes to safety, when it comes to bioterrorism? And what's been very interesting to me is despite my own appetite for CRISPR science, despite my own appetite, the CRISPR technology, despite my own gargantuan appetite for entrepreneurship and business, CRISPR really as a topic is so mesmerizing and all encompassing that there is a lot of aspects that we have to ponder as a parent, as a consumer, as an educator, as a scientist, as a civilian, um, as a member of multiple national academies of science and engineering and inventors. How do we talk about science? How do we communicate about science? How do we exploit science? How do we engage with industry? How do we engage with government? How do we make recommendations to investors or regulators or scientists or industry uh, or investors, right? What are the takes? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And one thing that I've learned, and I've learned that into the scientific communication class uh, that Todd mentioned at the outset of how do we even talk about CRISPR? How do you adapt your narrative, your focus, your content, your delivery to an audience? Do you focus on values because you're a good steward of science? You're gonna advance safe and efficacious therapies to save lives? Or you're going to talk to food consumers that want a trustworthy voice, someone they can relate to, a farmer, or a selfless academic scientist that works at a state institution, right? How do we tout the benefits for the environment, sustainability, resilience, breeding a healthier and better forest, maybe the biggest challenge that we have lying ahead of us today? What are the benefits for the consumer, not the benefits for the scientists? 
not the benefits for industry, not the benefits for governments, import, export, and the bioeconomy, but how safe is our food? How sustainable is our system? How good stewards or not are we of the environment and livestock? Transparency, dare I say, responsible research and innovation. Do we have trust in the scientific enterprise? Can we make this economically viable and sustainable? Can we promote engagement and trust from an ever skeptic consumer base, anti-science biased consumer base? And can we really engage in true dialogues and collaborative spirit between industry and academia? How are we gonna do that in therapeutics to me is very easy. So I'm not gonna talk about therapeutics. Um, when I mean easy, I mean more straightforward. Uh, people have shown this already. Saving lives, curing disease, curing cancer, correcting genetically diseased alleles that we know from our gene pool, and having those patients, having those patients' advocacy group, having those patients' relatives and parents and offsprings and family members express how grateful they are for the miracles of medicine uh, there's very little argument that goes against that, right? Other than ethics and the challenges of journal editing, access to the IP and on and on and on. But let's just assume therapeutics is covered and acceptable. The biggest challenge is not the couple hundred million people that could benefit from that. It's the other 9 billion people that need this for a selfier, healthier, and more sustainable food. That's ad. That's the USDA versus the ECJ. That's our ability to unleash those powerful technologies to breed better, safer, and more robust crops, more robust livestock, more robust forests. And I went through an exercise last year at Christmas in 2019, not trying to have hindsight in the past decade of CRISPR, but try to propose foresight for 2020. And some of this has been true. We have had clinical success, which will beget in its own public enthusiasm and some technological acceptance, at least for therapeutics. I think my former colleagues, I used to be European, uh, will eventually come to the realization that technology can be good and beneficial. And if they don't, they won't stay competitive and they will fall further behind. They are already behind they will stay behind and eventually some of them will catch up. Are we gonna industrialize those powerful technologies beyond therapeutics? When it comes to IP drama and licensing, and can we look beyond this and transcend economic barriers to entry, for-profit challenges to democratize those technologies? Are we gonna see some deals in the CRISPR space in the 29 companies that I outlined earlier today? Are we gonna have more guidelines on how to use this to secure rule, the Royal Society rule, uh, the NAS report recently, um, and there are WHO opinions, and there may be even looming UN opinions on the acceptability um, and guidelines on how to use that technology for various applications. And last but not least is geopolitical games. I mentioned China. I'm gonna mention Russia. I'm gonna mention the UK and out of the EU. I'm gonna mention the bioeconomy and trade and imports and exports and investors, geopolitically, globally, currently making strategic decisions on where and how much to invest funds and resources in the genome editing revolution. Not in the public library room, but also in the corporate boardroom, as much in your house as in the White House. Maybe not under that president, there's a different conversation. So I think there's a lot of things at stake right here that are very timely, very compelling, and very intriguing. At a very time, mind you, where the ag industry itself is organizationally being redefined, redistributed, reconsolidated, new opportunities to communicate and diversify with the US now second in the world. We only have Corteva left from DuPont and Pioneer. Monsanto was bought by a German company. Somebody said that five years ago, it would be laughed out of the room, even virtually, right? 
but Bayer and BSF in Europe, Syngenta in China, and Corteva in the US are the big ad companies in the world. We're number two, right? So can they rebrand? Can they talk about editing as a non-GM alternative? Can they go away from chemicals to biologicals? Can they steer the big ship more in a more nimble fashion, more strategic fashion to shape the future of food and ad? I would hope so. As a matter of fact, our task as a scientific community, as an educational institution, as a state moral act institution at that, academics have a role to play in fueling the science underpinning the CRISPR craze. Because we are breeding the researchers of the future. We are advancing the technologies of the future. We are training and shaping the minds of the thought leaders of tomorrow in industry, academia, and government. Speaking of which, we also have a duty to educate our politicians. I've mentioned Congress, the White House, staffers. This is not a trivial task whatsoever. Go ask my friend Tony Fauci, let alone regulators. And how do we patent this and commercialize that? Obviously, industry can be at times a friend and at times a foe, right? Entrepreneurs have a, a kindred spirit to some of the scientific innovators in academia with a sense of urgency to unleash those powerful technologies for profit as opposed to for selflessness. But aligned interests compel investors to provide the resources that are needed to take it to the next level and partner with the right industrial partners that have the right value, the right motives, the right strategic vision for the future. And farmers are a very important voice at the table, in my opinion. But last but not least, again, as an associate member of GES, the S part is more important than the GE part. The public, the consumers, the patients, their relatives, the stakeholders, the media more than ever has a very important role to play in the management and dissemination of narratives that are science bound, right? When it comes to ethics, when it comes to business, when it comes to scientific data, and as a member of multiple national academies, I'm at times embarrassed at some of the communications that I see on national TV and in the news. At an era where science is an all-time best and all-time high, we have to face skepticism, anti-science bias, and distorted narratives. So in closing here, a few things I would hope that you get to know after listening to me for 34 minutes. There is life to CRISPR beyond therapeutics. It's a very disruptive technology. It's globally democratized. From a business standpoint, concurrent tech push and market pool. And 2020, maybe 2021, will be pivotal towards the acceptance or not of that technology in different markets, notably ad. But five things you should ponder moving forward. How can we nudge the acceptance bottleneck by consumers that are have very little appetite for science, but a big illusion of knowledge. They use social media to inform their opinions. This is just the beginning of CRISPR. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more where that came from. The trajectory is very clear. How are we as academics gonna navigate the nexus with entrepreneurs, industry, government, and society? In full closing of the circle that Todd opened uh, 35 minutes ago now, how are we gonna train the next generation of scientists to communicate about science, to articulate? scientific concepts that are complex, but make them sound reasonable, make them feel approachable and relatable and trustworthy. Not just noteworthy, but trustworthy. And on the highway of science, are we gonna go too fast, so fast that we make people uncomfortable and we don't have the speed limits already there, or are we gonna go so slow that we're missing out on changing the world at the pace at which it needs to change? because we see access to medicine, access to food, and sustainability of the forest, we cannot wait. How are we gonna balance that need and a cautious, mindful advance? And I think science communication is gonna be the future 
of the S part in GES. In an era of skepticism, in an era of people who don't trust voices that are experts in their field, lifelong, lifelong you know, uh, selfless governmental employees who have saved lives don't get believed by half the population in our own work. How transparent can we be and how are we gonna carry out responsible research and innovation in the CRISPR space? So I'm gonna stop at this point in time because I'm presuming, assuming, maybe even hoping that there's gonna be a lively conversation in the 25 minutes that we have left. Um, I'm gonna acknowledge uh, all the funding and collaboration I get from industry and from academia, including funding from the NIH, including funding from the DOE, but perhaps more importantly, uh, disclose and more critically acknowledge uh, the great privilege that I've had to bring some of those scientific concepts and technologies all the way to the real world, to your plate if you've had yogurt and cheese at any point in time that wasn't homemade since 2011. Therapeutics that Intelia, Caribou, and Locus are testing currently in patients in the US. In food and ag products that Inari and Invio are working on and hopefully in a more sustainable forest with healthier trees that Trico and Jack Wang uh, are working on at this point in time. So I will stop sharing. I didn't, Todd, quite make my 30 minute commitment, uh, but I'm somewhat confident that I left enough time uh, to have a lively conversation over the foreseeable future in the next 22 minutes. Thank you all for inviting me today. And uh, I will let uh, Todd moderate what promises to be a colorful Q&A. That was great. Thank you so much and for leaving a lot of time for us to have a, a discussion. So mm -hmm. just to remind everyone, um, if you want to ask your question live, um, just use the raise hand feature and we will call on you and unmute you. You can also type your question into the chat box, which we already have one there. Um, but I'm going to use my moderator privilege to ask a question, Rodolph. You know, you mentioned the, the democratization of of CRISPR and then talked a lot about the consolidation of the, of the big ag companies. So I'm wondering if you could um, talk a bit about how that IP structure looks now and in the future in terms of this technology actually being democratized in the ag space. Yeah, so, so one of the great unintended consequences of big ag consolidation has been created a vacuum whereby all the creative people, all the original people, all the people who don't wanna be encumbered and limited with freedom to operate and degrees of freedom in the act space are, are fueling the genesis of a whole new generation of startup companies like Inari and Pairwise and Trico and many others actually across the globe um, that are building new technologies that fall outside of the cast non IP. That's where CAS3 came from, that's where CAS12 came from, that's where CASTN came from. So, so, so there's a lot of new technologies that scientists out of need and sense of urgency have been able to develop to circumvent those IP graphs that came in early on. Um, and it's created by consolidation, a whole gap for small and eventually mid-size and for those who have high aspirations, large size, next generation large ad companies who will do things differently, who will do things with different values besides profits, who will have uh, sustainability at the forefront of their agenda, who will partner with farmers, not consider them as customers um, or sell points or income providers, so I think I'm, I'm seeing in my world across the globe, even in Europe, dare I say, uh, some very hopeful signals that this big ad consolidation has created opportunities for the next generation of CRISPR disruptive companies to do that. And if you take it all the way to, you know, give us an example of a company that's far enough that people know it to exemplify how you can revolutionize big ag, I bring you Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, right? The great Pat Brown is using genome engineering to make an alternative, you know, plant-based burger that actually tastes good. 
If that's not disruptive big ag, then I can't come up with a better example. All right, guys, we're gonna go, I'm gonna swap back and forth. So we have a question from Allison in the chat box, which, which says, one of your slides mentioned CRISPR fatigue with reference to moving from technology to products. Could you speak a little more about this and have there been challenges in this transition? Yeah, so I think, I think it's, um, th this is a community that, that likes new things and hot things and you know, shiny new toys and new tools. And I think, I think between 2018 and, and 2020, there was a lot, maybe even too much focus on new tech. You know, CAS 9, CAS 10, CAS 11, CAS 12, CAS 13, CAS 14, CAS like WTF, right? So I think, I think there was a little bit too much, too fast. And people were like, okay, that's great. You have a great tech. Now give me a product, right? And people were tired of the IP conundrum and were tired of, you know, the IP grabs and were tired of the toolbox enhancement and were... They wanted to see the reality of using tech that's already good and existing to make a tangible impact. Give me a product, give me something that has made a real difference. Um, and this is why I'm kind of pleased that in 2020, we've already seen three different clinical trials with early data come out on sickle cell, beta thalassemia, and, 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 and Lieber um, showing uh, that a single dose. In a handful of patients, it's not dozens, let alone hundreds of thousands, but a handful of patients, Victoria Gray on NPR, as an example, a handful of patients have had tremendous benefits, no adverse response, no adverse effect, very good clinically relevant therapy, and a single dose for sickle cell has prevented the needs ever since to go on transfusion. So very strong signal, very real, and I think there was some fatigue of you promise, you promise, you promise, you promise. We hear about CRISPR is great, CRISPR here, CRISPR there, CRISPR everywhere. Show us a tangible product, show us tangible success. Um, I think that has had, um, uh, that has finally come to fruition. And I think that's kind of opening the door for the reality of CRISPR products uh, coming to the marketplace. All right, uh, Dylan, you should be unmuted. So go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, that was a great talk. I just wanted to ask about off-target effects. Uh, you know, I know that especially early on, that was a big concern. I'm wondering where the science is now on, uh, on that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like, like any technology, right. Early on, there was some legitimate concern about how specific, how efficient, how much mosaicism do you get or not? What are the unintended effects of target effects and on and on and on? And a few early studies done in vitro in the lab were somewhat concerning. Um, but fast forward six years later, uh, there was a lot more arm waving than there should have been. And people who are experts are using those molecular machines and do the hard work that you need to do to optimize them, select the right guides, do the right on to off target ratio, select the right PAMs, do the tiling. And again, I don't want to go too long here, but people who do it the hard way and the long way and the right way generate therapies for which thus far of targeting has not been an issue whatsoever. So, so it's more a question of, can we get enough on target to get a therapeutic effect? And there's different modalities and different amounts and different doses and different, different delivery regimes that have different efficiencies and different concerns. We're not at the point where we can have systemic gas line expressed everywhere because you're going to have um, off target to some extent in some cases. But for the therapies that are currently in the development in vivo and ex vivo, the amount of success that we've had uh, has been compelling enough to convince the FDA, to convince patients to try those therapies as, an, as a matter of fact, showcase in a clinical setting that's FDA condoned that there are tangible therapeutic benefits upon the first three tests in three different indications by two different companies. So I've targeted a lot of own way. And so, um, so Eli is sort of building on these IP questions. He's, he's asking if there will be a public gene editing tool. So, um, I mean, C CRISPR is democratized to the point where not-for-profit usage is widely open. Right, so so there are uh, genome editing tools that can be obtained uh, if you order it before 3 p.m. Eastern at Adgene. You may get your construct tomorrow. 
as a matter of fact. So it's readily available, um, but the pursuit of financial gains from those technologies per the USPTO and patent law uh, are financially incentivized to the original inventors that have spent the resources that are needed for the technology to advance. So, so you know, they are available for license from a number of providers. I could give a whole, whole day seminar on CRISPR IP, challenges, opportunities, uh, barriers to entry, uh, how to circumvent different plays and on and on, how to license it, how to pull it. So, so there's some IP pool conversations that have been put in the marketplace, um, but it is available for not-for-profit for sure. And it is available for profit if you have the ability and willingness to negotiate your license for your field of use. So I've been involved in 10 different startup companies that go from human therapies to antimicrobials, to trees, to food, to ag, to bacteria, uh, uh, to diagnostics and on and on and on and on. And rest assured in every single case, uh, a different IP strategy has been developed that hundreds of companies are working on. Uh, and there is a path to IP for sure, but the illusion that anybody can get access to any tech for free uh, is hardly defensible from a legal standpoint, no matter how good the tech is. Okay, I'm gonna to try to do these questions in order. And the next one I think is from, uh, from Jason Delborn. Uh, so he writes, the emphasis on medical applications is a good indicator of the power of the market to steer innovation. The profit margins in health are much larger than agriculture or environmental applications. How can we, as scientists and public universities, steer innovation to address public goods that might be ignored by the market? Are there different kinds of partnerships we can create? Do we need to focus on policy levers? And will educating young scientists in responsible research and innovation be enough? Um. So yes, 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 and yes, and no at the end, because it's more than just educating the next generation of scientists. So, so there are many things that we are doing. There are many things that the whole community is doing and working on. Orphan disease is a great example, right? If you have a couple hundred people uh, afflicted by an orphan disease that is genetically identified, pharmaceutical companies will not work on it. But there are selfless, driven, um, a tremendous scientists across the globe that are addressing those rare diseases, right? Antimicrobial resistance, another example. Sustainability, another example. Jack and I are working on, you know, breeding better forest, not for now, not for the next year, or 2050 and beyond. Um, and, and, you know, all the trainees I've had in my lab, the CRISPR lab in the last eight years that I've graduated, all 12 of them went to industry. They're all hopefully well-trained, they're all hopefully wise enough to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and how to make the world a better place. But sadly enough, the market for therapeutics is where a lot of the money is. So some of them have gone to Boston and are working for big companies with big paychecks targeting big diseases, but some of them work for a lot less money at um, less for-profit organizations that are trying to, to tackle issues that are more societally important and if you think about it, and I've mentioned it in passing for, for Jason, a couple hundred million people maybe in the world could benefit in the next decade or two from genome editing therapeutically. But we have billions of people who could benefit in the next few years from a more sustainable and, and, um, and beneficial ag industry. And there is probably 10 to 15 billion people in the next 100 years that could benefit tremendously from reading a better forest. So there are thousands of academics working on this. And I think the new generation of entrepreneurs have a true appetite for value driven and an appetite to tackle big challenges in partnership with industry, in partnership with academia, in partnership with not-for-profits to, to really do what it takes to be at the forefront of developing new solutions for big problems that transcend financial gain. And I'm not naive here. I've seen it firsthand. I'm a believer, but it's still very hard to resist or overlook the financial appeal of you know, therapeutics and on and on and on. That's why we're at NC State. That's why uh, I'm, I'm presuming most of you are here today. Most of you do the large majority of your time 
And, and this is why I'm very hopeful that we'll be able, as a community here, to shape the future of CRISPR. I gave my first talk at CRISPR at NC State in 2012 on interview. It's almost 10 years ago. People didn't care. I've given dozens of talks on campus in 2012, 2013, 2014, to try to compel people in my own department and my own college to invest in CRISPR-based breeding, to be at the forefront of plant and crop breeding and livestock breeding. And it's not until the PSI is gonna come out that we're gonna do it, right? It's hard to do, it's hard to believe, it's hard to accept. I'm not a very convincing speaker necessarily. So like to get the enthusiasm, to buy the value proposition is not trivial whatsoever. And there's a reason why it's easier for me to get money out of companies and it's easy for me to get money from NIH or DOE or NSF or USDA because when I talk to an investor, they see the value. When I don't get to talk to a, a, a rating committee from some grant that I can't articulate, it's much more difficult to do. And they see CRISPR, they're like CRISPR, Schmipper, never heard of it, it's crap, come back next year or next year or next year. And in the meantime, you're halfway through a real company coming up with a real product. And by the time they come knocking on my door saying, oh, you guys should, apply for grants to the government to do CRISPR-based genome editing in plants. I'm like, you're talking to the wrong person. I told you five years ago and you passed, go ask someone else, right? So there's some frustration there in the sense of urgency and to, um, to the point that Jason brought up, I think there's hope, and there's opportunities, but to bring those ingredients together to be successful is not trivial whatsoever. Okay, uh, Matthew, uh, you should be unmuted. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, Rodolph. Good to good to hear from you. Uh, awesome perspective. I have a, 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 I guess, a PR question for you. So, you know, in today's world of anti-vaxxers and science denial, how do we keep CRISPR sort of from going down that same path as it becomes more ubiquitous and um, as its applications become sort of unavoidable? Yeah, very, very good question. And uh, again, thank you, Matt, for the question and the insights. And this is exactly why uh, my last point in my talk was SciCom 2.0. The, the biggest challenge is not the science, it's not the tech, it's not the application, it's not even maybe the product, right? The biggest challenge moving ahead is going to be acceptance. Not really acceptance by regulators, because that, that's negotiable. And oftentimes, they make science-informed wise decisions just a matter of how long it takes for them to get to the, to the foregone conclusion, even in Europe. Um, so to me, the real challenge is the public. At a time of anti-vaxxers, anti-global warming, anti-science, anti-COVID-19 vaccines, I don't trust scientists, I don't trust industry, I don't trust academia, and my opinions are informed by social media from people who have no legitimacy, no expertise, just happen to tweet something that meets my broken mental model, that's the challenge that we have before us. And how to address that, how to develop narratives and voices and strategies, how to articulate this based on values, how to, to get the right relatable, personable narrators who will uh, engage those, those challenging, but also opportunistic um, uh, stakeholders in due time is really what the next frontier is for science. This is why we made human nature. This is why I, I can't wait to be more involved in the GES. This is why NC State is investing in science communication. This is why we're discussing this right now, and I'm not talking about the great, exciting scientific discoveries that we have in the CRISPR lab, because SciCom is the bottleneck. And unless we are strategic and aware and we deploy marketing strategies that come from a business school, right, that come from a thought leading organization like the GES, uh, advocating for science is not the way to go. It doesn't work. Getting academics to give public seminars does not work. Um, uh, you need to adapt to the 21st century and we need to rethink, reassess, redefine, reframe how we engage with, um, with those stakeholders that we need to convince in order to fully deploy those technologies and enable the world to benefit from them. 
Okay, we have a question from Adam. I'm going to try to get maybe two more questions in. Um, so question, uh, Adam is asking, we're saying one aspect of responsible innovation, I would say, in addition to envisioning beneficial outcomes of a technology, is to envision detrimental outcomes and how they could be prevented. What are some of the potential detrimental outcomes from CRISPR applications that you're most concerned about and what type of actions could be taken to avoid them? Yeah, so, so again, qu quickly, because again, we could talk about that for an hour. So I'm gonna give two specific um, uh, examples and illustrations. Number one, human journal identity, right? I mean, somebody who's been broadly condemned uh, globally by the scientific community and the public irresponsibly use this technology allegedly to engineer humans without CCR5 to address HIV from which they weren't even sick in the first place. So, so those things do happen. And there's a great uh, report that came out recently, maybe it's incomplete in my opinion, but there's a, there's a decent report that came out recently from my colleagues at the NAS and the Royal Society that discusses this. And it's not ready for prime time and doing human journal engineering, generally speaking, is condemnable and it's too early and we're not there yet. And a lot of people are opining on this. The UN and WHO and others will do that in due time, as you know. The other issue is bioterrorism and dual use. And that's why I showed the example of the butterfly. If you can do that to a butterfly and you can edit a human to make them better, then you could edit COVID-19, make it more virulent. You could bring back cholera. You can bring back the black plague. You can engineer the flu to be circumventing vaccines and on and on and on. So for every good use I could think of, my uh, imagination could think of a creative, undesirable use to weaponize it. And that's where the law, and that's where monitoring, and that's where the Department of Defense and intelligence communities need to do their job uh, to ensure that they monitor that to some extent, because self-policing by scientists is not a good idea, as we all know at GES. <laughs> um, and governance is critical, but enforcement is the biggest deterrent. Um, and so I think that's, that's, a, that's a huge gap. And that's where biohackers don't do the scientific community a service. As you know, Todd and I both discussed that people making their own vaccines with CRISPR, not necessarily a good idea. And dare I say, a form of natural selection that we shouldn't rely on as a, as a species. Okay, we're gonna have, I'm gonna ask Ruben to ask your question quick and this will be the last one for today. So uh, go ahead, Ruben. Hi, Rodolf. Um, uh, great talk. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, so uh, I think we all agree that uh, we know how to do this, uh, that the technology uh, is safe. And you uh, commented on, on, on very clear examples where this can be um, uh, successful, like uh, sickle cell disease, etc. Now, my question is for more uh, complicated uh, traits, like yield implants, how we know how to do it, which genes do you uh, do we choose? Um, what combination of genes, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Can you comment uh, a little bit on uh, on that? Absolutely. So, so we're eight years in, and we already have success in the clinic. So we've taken it pretty far, and it's very encouraging. And it's on the meteoric rise across the board. But there's a reason why uh, single genes is the first generation targets. I, I hate to call them low hanging fruit. I would call them more accessible fruits on the tree of life. Um, so multigenic traits, complex traits, DNA, DNA interactions, gene by environment interactions, uh, uh, DNA, RNA interactions, uh, feedback loops and regulatory processes. Um, we need people like Jack Wang to generate 10,000 engineered variants to build machine learning models to decipher and predict the behavior of hundreds of potential modifications through multiple iterations across the genome to really understand what we can change, how we can change, what edits we want, how many edits we want, how to multiplex it, and on and on and on. So it's very complicated indeed in many cases. And that's exactly the reason why uh, first generation genome editing is focusing on single gene effectors um, and edits. Uh, but there are already people working on schizophrenia, right? So delivering that to the brain and making up to hundreds of edits is a lofty goal, but we've got to start somewhere. And people are already tackling very long-term, down-the-line, ambitious goals of multi-traits, multi-gene, interactive pathway, 
feedback loop laden uh, uh, complex genetic networks. We don't quite have the tools yet. We don't quite have the delivery yet. We don't quite have the models yet, but we will build our levels of complexity to where we need to be to address them. And uh, my assessment of the landscape of the community working on this is uh, relatively confident that we have a map on how to get there, but we got to start with simple before we start with difficult and complex. And, and we'll get there, but it will take time. All right, thank you very much, Rodolf. This has been fascinating. I really appreciate it. Um, just a reminder for everyone, um, next week, um, we're gonna have a really interesting talk by some, uh, some bio designers and artists talking about pink chickens. Um, so please come join us for that. I think you'll be really um, interested, entertained, and it's really gonna get you to think um, about some of the implications of, of these technologies. So Rodolf, thank you again so much. Um, and hopefully we'll see everyone again next week.